Mateo Flores. I'm so excited you're here. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, such a treat. So you are an embodiment coach. You've facilitated hundreds of breathwork sessions. And we are going to discuss breathwork and how it transforms people and this concept of embodiment and what the hell it is. <laughs> um, but I wanted to first start with uh, your journey. What led, what led you to this work? I think just the recognition of how important movement was, was one of the beginning entry points and a general curiosity about what the underlying mystery of this experience that we're having is. Mm. You know, I think my first real taste of that was through music. I remember at a young age having experiences at music festivals where it just like clicked in my head, wait, something bigger is going on here. Like, what is this? What are these thousands of people all doing in unison, being there, having their souls and emotions moved by vibrations in the airwaves? It, it, it got me to begin to start to question like, what, what's happening? And I think that's really a central like starting point that a lot of people can begin with, just start wondering more, like what what is this experience that we're sharing? And by simply following that path, it led me here. Mm. And there's a lot of steps along the way, but I think that was definitely the starting point, a, uh, a deepening look past just this acceptance that we tend to be born into. Mm. That's a juicy one right there, accepting just what is versus actually exploring. I experienced your breath work, and you are very powerful in the way you deliver uh, the entire process. Like, you're in it with us. You're not just, like, kind of walking around facilitating. You're, like, in it. <laughs> and, you're, and that has to have been a journey as well in itself. Like, was it, did you, were you kind of, like, innately thrown into breath work, and how did that come about? I was really lucky that... I was introduced to kind of the deep end very early on. When I did my yoga teacher training, one of the experiences we had was like a full on bioenergetic cathartic release breathwork class where we, we breathed for an hour and we were also cussing and screaming and releasing. And it was, you know, it was, it was such a blessed opportunity to get, to be exposed to that right as I was jumping into the world of like movement, yoga and breathwork. It wasn't, you know, something that, I had to dig deep into it. It was right there from the starting point. That connection between breath work and catharsis was like tied together right at the beginning of me starting to understand this stuff. It was made very clear that the breath was a pathway for us to release trapped and stored feelings and emotions. And, and so I've, I've always kind of looked at it as part of that ever since. Share how. So it's really interesting. I'm studying the science of this more. And a lot of the stuff that we intuitively understand, anybody who's done breath work, you know, they'll know that by breathing, you can regulate the rhythms and oscillations of your body. But as I start to understand it deeper, it's fascinating the connection between our, our like vascular system, like the actual flow of blood pumping through our body starts to be regulated to the rhythm of our breath. And of course the oxygenation, but that also sends like electrical signals up to our brain that switches the state of, uh, of frequency that our brain is operating in. So to anybody who's like done breath work, it's super obvious that, yeah, we can control our mind and our body through breathing. When you start to study how these systems interact, it, it's, it's very fascinating to me at least. Yeah. I've understood it, especially holotropic breath work, where it's a three-part breath, your stomach, your chest, and exhale. Inhale to your stomach, your chest, your exhale. And you're, it, you do this at a relatively rapid rate, and you're taking really full breaths. So you, to some degree, you're hyperventilating, mm -hmm. but in a controlled manner. And so you're hyper oxygenating your, your body and for some reason that ends up releasing a DMT, right? From your brain produces DMT and then it that's the chemical that is released at the beginning and the end of your life, and that's why you have a flashback at the end of your life of your whole life. And so this this compound DMT gives you the opportunity to then go back into your childhood or at some point in your life where something was not resolved. And and you get to view it as a an adult instead of a child where you just have your, your childlike coping mechanisms that may have served you in that moment, but later on they don't, right? And they kind of work against you as an adult. Can 
be. Um, and so this gives you this opportunity to re reframe the story and, and rewrite the story essentially so that you can choose different patterns moving forward. Um, because often as a child, we, we decide that, oh, in that given moment, um, we're not good enough or you know, self-doubt is, uh, is the natural tendency for our brain. And so this breathwork experience literally gives the opportunity, and from my experience, um, to rewrite the story and then choose completely different patterns that are way more empowering. So that's my version of breathwork and why it's supported me through a lot of transformation. And I always emphasize in my classes that the breath work is just a key that opens the doorway. And the doorway is you giving yourself the permission to express what you need to express. Mm -hmm. Expression is the only way to release repressed, trapped, stored, emotional, energetic blocks. And a lot of times that stuff comes up and the doorway's open, but we can't quite step through it because we still have that culturally imposed uh, narrative running through our head that keeps us limited. Mm -hmm. And this is like a, a emotional virus where that gets instilled in us at, at a very young age. And if we're never conscious of these programs running in our brain, then it's not really possible for us to create the, the dissonance that we need to relate to them in a way that's actually empowering for us. So I, I, we're really lucky that we live in Austin, Texas, right? Because we have a, a powerful mantra wired into this space, which is keep Austin weird. And weirdness really is that essential component that allows you to cross through the threshold. It's, it's our internal intuitive expression juxtaposed against this cultural pressure that's, that's kept us trapped for so long. So it's like the, the breath is the key to start to open and unlock this stuff. But I've, after doing hundreds of breathwork classes, I see the people who really tap into the magic. And it's not just the people who breathe, but it's the people who can let themselves feel regardless of what they might think that looks like to the outside world. Wow. I have never heard it expressed that way. I love that. Keep Austin Weird actually allows you to be authentically you. So I say like every time we are losing our shit and healing ourselves, we're doing our civic duty. Ah, huh. I love it. That is brilliant. Well done. Well said. Thank you. Um, all right. Let's, I'm so curious, this concept of embodiment, like what does that actually mean to you? Yeah. I've been going a little bit of like mad rambling man on this thing. It, it, whenever you go <laughs> so deep on something, it's very, uh, possible to kind of lose yourself in it. And, and I'm, I'm starting to reach the edges of that in my exploration of exactly what does embodiment mean. So I have a few definitions, you know, uh, the one that's like really catchy and I've been using for my branding is it's the bridge between imagining and being right. So we have this potential inside of us that we must draw forth into actuality. And that's definitely a piece of embodiment. But I'll just, I'll, I'll throw you some other definitions that have been kind of interesting lately and we can, we can explore a little deeper, right? Embodiment in one sense is a, a unification because if, you know, every single part of yourself individualized itself, like if your finger was like, I'm my own separate myself, right? Then there would be no you. If every cell in yourself individuated and didn't unify, then there is no embodiment, Right? So in a sense, embodiment is that line of unification where we have self-awareness. Self-awareness is sort of the membrane around which embodiment unifies. Now where I get a little madman about it and I'm trying to like put the pieces together with definition is self-awareness is also a division because in order to embody this, we have to divide from all that, right? So in order for your... Uh, you to conceive of yourself as an individual, you have to separate from the reality of totality, which is, it's not individual, it's unified. And this is part of the way that our mind works. It, it, it sees the world in this cause and effect nature, which is really not uh, the scientific truth, right? The, the scientific truth is a holistic reality, a holistic interaction. And we can see that in the body, in the way that we view everything, right? That we do see things in terms of their desperate parts when in actuality they interact in unison. So like we think about our hands, right? Or our elbows or our knees, but really like it's all one interconnected thing. 
So this paradox between the division of being self-aware and the unification that defines embodiment has kind of been like tumbling itself in my mind like a, a, a rock polisher. <laughs> and hopefully a diamond will form from that eventually. I think the central question we can ask ourselves is why aren't we embodied? Why aren't we doing what we should, right? Like what are the factors disembodying us, right? Mm. And I'm curious, like, Go what is there, that? Yeah. What does that bring up for you? If I was to ask you, why don't we do what we should? Why aren't we embodying our fullest? Like, what comes to mind for you? Yeah, I think it, you're you tapped on something. It, it, it's separation to some degree. It's there. There's maybe a thought that um, someone else ha doesn't have a good intention, or um, yeah, maybe you are you you are onto something that I wasn't aware of. Um, what is it to you? So I simplify it into three different, I, 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 you know, I think it comes back to maps and understandings that, you know, we understand the world through a mapping of the world that is never the actuality of what the world is. So that's kind of central. There's this recognition that like no way of looking at it is ever going to be the actuality. It's ever going to be a perfect representation. And in fact, we don't want it to be because that's not useful for us, right? If you had a map that was exactly the same as the actuality, you wouldn't be able to use it. We need it smaller. We need it scaled so that it's actually has utility for us. So creating maps is how we understand things. The map that I'm currently using is understanding the body through three different layers or lenses. Our physical, like, you know, actual embodied self. Uh, and then the emotional, energetic uprising that comes from that physiological phenomenon, and then the psychological component that all feeds back together. So it's like the, uh, the stimulus that our body receives sends a signal to our mind that then releases a, uh, a neurochemical response that creates a magnetic charge that interacts with the electrical charge of the nervous system stimulation going through us, which creates this electromagnetic field, which is the mediating factor between our physical and our psychological. That, that's the map I'm using currently, right? But again, what's important about a map is not how realistic it is, but how useful it is. And I find that map useful because I can start to assess things through those different lenses and start to better understand the mediation between them, even though all of it is one. So why don't we do what we know we should? Yeah. So I use those three layers as a, a, a way of contextualizing it, right? There's, if we simplify it, there's three possibilities. One, your body is f lacking physical capacity for it. Like there is a phys physical limitation. Two, you are not able to properly manage the energetic emotional layer of uprising. Or three, your mind can't figure it out, right? So if we use that map of there being three layers to our self, mm. um, those are the three layers through which we might not be able to do what we should. Yeah, I'm hearing that like if you were looking at the map through your lens, right, your perception based on your experiences, you'll have a different experience of the map versus like if we both looked at one map, we'd be looking at two potentially two different realities, right? And so if my mind is somehow distorted and my perception is distorted based on some experiences that led me to not be so kind at all times, or not trust that other someone's going to reciprocate that kindness, um, then I'm not embodying, fully embodying kindness. Is that what I'm hearing? Does that make sense? So there's, there's so much I could say. <laughs> Talking about em embodying kindness, it's, it, it's, again, it comes back to the way that we understand things. And these words have different associations for them. So for you to embody kindness, you need to have an association for what kindness looks like embodied. Mm, right. So again, we create, we create a map of that. We create representations. And it's really fascinating the way that our mind actually does map. We use an attentional filter to limit out the incoming stimulus into things that are important to us. So there's a reason that kindness becomes an important thing to you because in your past experiences, you've been shown that it's relevant to yourself. It's, it's, it's been highlighted within your filtering process to be emphasized. Yeah. Maybe for your survival, maybe for, you know, survival could come down into how we play with the culture among us. And, and that is kind of the central point to where this repression comes from. 
um, because you know the way that we interact, we are such social creatures, is so essential to that state of survival. Whereas, like an animal, their attentional filter isn't focused towards kindness, right? They're right? Survival. They're focused on yeah. immediate physical threat because they right. don't have that social psychological dynamic that we have. Yeah. So to embody kindness, you need to have a, a reference for what that looks like and how the effects of that uh, play into the way that you're filtering your attention. So a lot of times if like someone's not being kind, it's because they don't see it, right? Mm -hmm. It's not always like a conscious choice that I'm going to be unkind. And if it is a conscious choice, that's coming from unconscious factors. Right. Because we're always being kind of filtered through this unconscious lens. What do you want to embody? My potential. Ooh, juicy go. What does that mean to you? Yeah. And again, that's a very deep question. I think the potential is that that uh, imagined virtual projection of ourself and what we could be if we always did the things we know we could, we should. Mm. And a lot of my philosophy comes from Stephen Pressfield in his book, The War of Art. And this understanding that there is, and this is like the central map that I've installed as my base operating system, is that there is a calling inside of us. And this calling is is pulling us towards what we're meant to be, but there is a force that works in opposition to that. And I think this is what makes life interesting. It's this resistance, right? This, this, this push in opposition against us doing what we know we should. So that's like the central operating system through which I look at things through. There is this potential, and then there is the actuality of what I do every day. And it shows up in simple ways. Like I want to, I should do the dishes, but I don't want to do the dishes, right? And that complexifies with more dynamics when they come into play and it becomes you know, more difficult to always discern what it is you know you should. But on a very simple base level, we have this call of, you know, I, I should go run, I should go, I should drink water, I should eat healthy, but I wanna do this, I wanna do this, I wanna do this. And it's that juxtaposition that I think we're really playing with. And yeah, embodying that potential is, is mastering all of the factors that feed into that resistance so that you can optimize it to the fullest. And what's beautiful about this game, and I think it's really interesting to look at life as a game, is that you can't ever win, right? Like we're playing against the greatest opponent ever. The more we max our potential, the more potential there is to be maxed out. It's like it, the resistance is always going to win eventually. And, you know, that shows up in the the actuality that eventually we're going to be under the ground, right? The physical representation of resistance in gravity, in temperature, in limited resource allocation wins always. But that doesn't mean we can't try to get the high score while we're here. Hmm. How do you listen? It's for me, it's like two, it's the, the angel and the devil on your shoulder. And which one are you going to listen to? <laughs> Essentially yeah. one's like the, your highest potential and one's the saboteur. Be like, yeah, but that joint looks really good. <laughs> like, yeah. Right. So how do you listen to the, the potential? How do you choose that voice instead of the one that tells you, eh, do the dishes tomorrow? So the map I'm using, again, has those three layers that we can look at it and assess it through. So if we look at maybe the physical layer to start, like where are we physically limited, that comes down to the way that our body has adapted over time due to our habits and relationship to the stressors of our environment. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of, and this is kind of the way that I'm formatting it. It is in terms of like keys of understanding, and I'm defining keys in terms of contextual lenses that give you leverage in this uh, understanding of resistance and open doors where there might otherwise be walls, provide breakthrough, right? So one crucial key of understanding is that our body is made to move, right? It's that simple. Like it, 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 the purpose and existence of this body is to move. And our culture is currently one that really enforces stagnation. So right there, there is a factor of limitation, right? This stagnation that is enforced by our current way of living goes against this disposition of what our body was designed for. Mm. So the more that we stagnate, the more that we limit ourselves, the more that that becomes a limiting factor in our ability to manifest our potential through our body. So that's just one example. Yeah. I mean, so much more I could say. Yeah, please keep going. 
So it's like, okay, now, now the question becomes more complicated. How, how do you move? How often do you move? And, uh, you know, to understand that we can really look at the history of like what movement was, right. And how did we get to this place? Like our body as humans evolved to be very nomadic. It evolved to be forging and evolved for a diversity of movement, walking, running, climbing, throwing, carrying, right. But as we shifted into the agricultural age, uh, those patterns became more limited. Now we were doing specific things like farming or climbing a ladder, right? Which is very different than climbing a tree. So in the, in the adaptation of our patternings of movement, there is a shifting in what our body uh, does versus what it was designed to do in a limitation that arises from that. And then, you know, uh, as that evolved, there was kind of a, a period in our history where it, it went from agricultural being the main purpose of our movement to now uh, we move primarily for war, for combat, right? And people would train for that purpose, that intention. They would do all the same things they did when they were nomadic trying to survive, but now they're wielding weapons and they're doing it with the purpose of like, uh, we, need to, we need to beat the other side, and then as, as that has progressed, we got into like the industrial age, which is used machines in a way where our movement is again limiting. We're less needed for combat. So we went through a, a period of intense stagnation that was just recently in the 1960s kind of recognized. And there has been a cultural shift towards this need to like work out, right? Like hmm. that wasn't always a thing. That's only been a thing for like 80 years. And the history and roots of where that idea came from is super fascinating. Now we have gyms, right, that people go to. And they're like, all right, I need to get my movement in at the gym or their workout in. They think of it in terms of fitness. And another problem with this is oftentimes our fitness and our movement has now become isolated into particular modalities, right? So whether you're a weightlifter, a crossfitter, a yogi, or a, a dancer, or a swimmer, like your patterning is isolated to that particular modality, which again becomes a limitation. So we need to recognize how the way in which we are viewing movement is limiting us and try to, one, diversify because there's a, a, a serious price we pay for specialization. While it does make us better at the thing we're doing, it makes us worse at everything else in, in general. So we need, to, we need to, one, we need to generalize our movement practice more. And two, we need to focus our movement practice more in the direction of our ancestral evolutionary uh, prerogatives, like what this body was designed for. So those are some keys on how you can start to like get the body to start to work more. And then it evolves through the energy and emotion and into our mind. And yes, yeah, so much more I could say. How does it then support you in choosing the, the, the higher potential right. thoughts? So that's a great question. When your body is more, is less limited, I'll say, you have better energetic and emotional uh, electrical signaling going through your system, which then enables you to have more will to make the right choices, right? Because will is a matter of energetic emotional management. We only have so much of it, and it is limited from our, the physical uprising of our body. So the, the cognition that makes the decision is, is, again, limited by the emotional energetic uprising. So it's like layers of limitation. And one thing that's useful about this map, because as I'm writing this book, I'm realizing, holy shit, this could be like this big of a book, right? But I'm cutting it all down with the question of this is useful because, because I, I don't, I don't want a map that is accurate. I want a map that is useful, right? So why this is useful looking at embodiment through these three layers is because it emphasizes uh, prioritization and uprising right? This is one big key. The body comes first. So don't try to solve, don't try to figure out like, how can I fix the, or connect more to the angel by thinking about it only because the body is limiting the energy and emotion, which is then limiting the psychology and it feedback loops. It goes both directions, but it does have this directionality of your mind travels through your energy and emotion into your body and your body signals through your energy and emotion up into your mind. So by that simple understanding, we can kind of work through it omnidirectionally, but with the priority of the body being foundational.
Fascinating. I love that. It's uh, what I'm hearing is when your body is physically strong, you can actually be mentally stronger. Hundred yeah. percent. And and you know, I, I train people as an embodiment coach, so this is something that we can actually we can develop attributes of psychology and emotional wellness by the way people move. For example. Uh, your nervous system resiliency under physical stress translates to your emotional resiliency under external situational stress. Mm. For example, when people are really like tired at the end of a set, they want to just fall apart and collapse. Their posture is like, oh shit, just falls to pieces, right? If you force yourself to maintain control of your posture and to not fall apart just because your nervous system is stressed, you build a resiliency that then carries out into the world. So I'll do things like, for example, I'll make people at the end when they're exhausted hold a posture of victory. Like they have their hands up, they smile on their face, they fight the fidgeting, they align themselves with gravity to optimize their relationship with it. That way they're instilling this, this understanding into themselves. Just because I feel something doesn't mean I lose control. Mm, wow. Powerful. It, that, and that's how you literally embody that. <laughs> yeah. Really powerful. Yeah. I, I think there's also a psychological component and it might be vain, but just to, to look in the mirror and be happy with yourself and to um, walk down the street feeling like literally physically strong and sexy is it, it gives you the courage to then do anything that you desire. And I think courage is the foundation of, of creating the life that you dream of. You've got to have the courage that to walk up to that girl, to move to Bali, to start a new job or to start a business. Like you need courage. And if, and I don't know if it's just vain, but from what you're saying, it sounds like it's not. It, 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 there, the physical strength supports that journey. hundred percent. And you know, um, I guess vain is, is a judgment as well. It's mm. like, uh, now, haters might say it's vain, but I'm just loving myself, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I actually had somebody comment um, on one of my Instagram posts last night saying, put a shirt on. Oh, wow. Which I never wear a shirt. It's like, <laughs> it's just who I am. I don't like wearing shirts. Um, and, and really grateful to be able to uh, receive that feedback in a way that wasn't triggering at all. Yeah. But it was a really interesting example of like exactly what you just brought up. Like someone saying I'm vain and me, I'm like, I was just doing what I do, right? Like without considering it, thinking it at all. So it's really a matter of perspective whether or not it's vain at all. But I think the the important thing is how you identify yourself, right? Because identity is the factor that determines the way that you behave. We, one of our greatest imperatives is to match our behavior to our identity. So when you identify as somebody who's strong and sexy, you're gonna behave as someone who's strong and sexy. And our identity is greatly tied to our virtual representation of how we see ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, this sounds um, sad, but it actually has a really beautiful lesson. Uh, there was a woman that was um, at the end of her life uh, due to cancer and she was choosing that. She didn't choose to um, heal herself through natural, natural ways. And, um, but one lesson she said that she's learned is wear your good stuff. Where are your good shit? And from that moment on, I get dressed up every day with my favorite clothes. Mm. I wear my favorite jewelry. I don't just, I, I, it's all out in display. I don't just tuck away, you know, like my favorite precious jewels in the corner and, and hide it in a closet. Like, you've got one life to live. Look your best every day. Like, show up 100% shirtless in your case, fine, but like, <laughs> you know, it, just, um, the way your appearance and, and it, I, I agree with you. It's, I don't think it's vain. I think it's, um, the way to love yourself the most so that you build your confidence the most so that you, um, then become a magnet for everything that you want. When it starts with how you look and feel about yourself. Yeah. 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 My yeah. problem with that is I sweat like three, four times a day. So <laughs> I got to have my workout clothes and my nice clothes. Otherwise mm. I'll run through my clothes really quick and they won't be yeah. so nice anymore. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not just it's not just how you look, but also how you internally feel, and I think a lot 100%. of that has to has to do with what you're eating as well. I mean, there's so many factors that go into whether or not you feel loved, if you're in a supportive community, um, if you're doing something with purpose, if you're making an impact. All of these things really contribute to uh, self-image and self-love. Um, on that note, uh, unity is important to you. Well, we were, yeah, we were just talking about this this element of unity in relationship to embodiment. And there's this amazing quote that just like stirs my soul. Um, it's talking about the price we pay for self-awareness, mm. right? And it, it really is a, a deep price that we 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 necessitate in order to have this understanding of ourself as a self, this, this idea, this ability to think about our thoughts in our thoughts, this ability to, to meditate on our meditations as an act of meditation, this like feedbacking mirror loop of self-reference. It, it blinds us to the world. It cuts us off from the reality that is that unified totality, this, this, interconnectedness of everything in the the full spectrum of all the light frequencies, of all the vibrational frequencies, of all the stimulus that is getting experienced in this very moment, we 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 cut ourselves from that and narrow ourselves down so that we have this experience of self-awareness. So it's a very hefty price we pay, but in return for that, it enables us to ask the important questions we gain the ability to you know wonder who are we what what am i what is this right we we're talking about how central that question is what am i here for those questions necessitate this degree of self referentialness you can't do it when you're in a state of instinct like animals aren't doing that right so we pay this great price but that's the what we get in exchange this this potential to bring forth you know, the possibility of what the mind is truly capable of. And the, the irony of that is that that same self-referential ability that gives us the potential to question in this way doesn't provide the answers, really. It's like the answers to who am I, what is this, what am I here for, really come from that unity, that totality, that grander reality beyond our self-referential barrier, but we wouldn't be able to ask the questions in the first place if we didn't have it. So there's this very interesting relationship between the actuality of holism, whether it's our body and, the, you know, this is, it's, it's built into the way that we view everything. We see the world in cause and effect, right? We look at a tree, we don't see the tree. We see leaves, we see branches, we see roots, we see, you know, the cell membranes of the tree or the, what do tree, trees don't have cells? They have like a bark or what are you? There's like a photoplasma or something oh, that I'm uh, not remembering. Chlorophyll. chlorophyll that's the one. <laughs> Nailed it. Can I get a high five yes. on that? Good job. <laughs> but you see, we see the chlorophyll all the way down to the atoms, right? This is how we understand reality. This is how our brain sees everything, but it's not the way the world actually is. And why do we see it like that? Well, because it's useful. So this comes back to like, use being more important than truth in terms of like the way that our mind views the world and operates through it. And, and I think this is where there's a lot of room for magic. You know, it's like, is it true? I don't know. Does it work? Then I'll do it. Um, so hmm. yeah. It, it, and, and there is a, there is a benefit that comes from zooming the lens in and out, right? Like we can go all the way down to the molecular level or we can zoom out to the chemistry level or we can zoom out to the anatomical level or we can zoom out to the actual organism. But even in the way that we understand the organism, it's like we think about ourselves in terms of individual muscles or individual organs when really it's all tied together. And this is a huge key for understanding the body. And it goes deep into the nature of like how our fascia actually works and the ways in which our map and understanding of our anatomy, while sometimes might be useful, in other ways is actually not serving us to really know our physical self. I mean, if you, if the fact that I can just shake my hand like that at on command and 
for what purpose or even how does my hand know to do like it is a fascinating concept that we really don't have any idea like how the brain transmits that idea instantaneously to my hand to just shake yeah is wild we have full control of this meat suit or whatever it's called right but then but we don't actually know how or why uh, yeah i have always i found the question who am i um almost impossible to answer because of course your brain immediately wants to go into the uh, identity of you know i'm a woman i'm tall i'm like you want to label it's all just physical or spiritual attributes or maybe characteristics but to answer the question who am i a spiritual being having a human experience i mean it, it, great that also doesn't help me <laughs> well y you know the an invitation i might offer is who do you want to be? Consider that. And then who am I could be who you need to be in order to be that person that you want to be. Okay. So, so for example, you know, and, and this is one of the most powerful questions we can answer. So it's really worth the time it takes to, to dig I've through it and figure it, it out. But there's never really an answer that I'm satisfied with that isn't characteristic. And it can change. It can evolve, right? It can, it can grow as you grow. But for example, my answer, my mantra, which has served me for the last four or five years is I am a force for transformation. Oh. I awaken those around me through example. I push towards execution. Uh, no, I push towards resistance and I embody execution. I am a force for transformation. I awaken those around me through example. I push towards resistance and embody execution. Wow. Beautiful. And that, that definition of myself is highly responsible for the reality that has unfolded since. When you are able to craft that inner operating system, even if you don't think about it every day, you know, and I, there's a really powerful practices you can use to reinforce this strongly. Um, you know, that's another pathway we could go down. But when you have that inner operating system, it, it, it kind of evolves the baseline of your being around it, mm. whether yeah. or not you're actively putting attention towards it or not. So one of the most powerful spells you can craft is answering that who am I question and doing it in a way that serves who you want to be. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You've finally clarified <laughs> how to answer that question. Thank you. And you know what's even cooler <laughs> is I have a process called peak integration where you can take like these peak breakthrough clarity states, right? That we all kind of like touch through our practices, but then tend to slip away. And you can capitalize on that by doing a, a, a practice where you project yourself into your dream potential future. And you capture that dream potential future viscerally. So you imagine yourself there in this moment and you take in all the sensory data involved in being in that future potential, whether it's emotions or what you're seeing and smelling. And then once you come out of that, you capture it externally by writing it down. Because that is the only way to make clarity really last is by externalizing it. And then once you take that externalization of your dream potential future, you can actually break that down into actionable goals that will get you there. So you can actually make a, a an action, like a plan. I need to do this, this, and this in order to get there. Okay. What are the pieces that break up each of those goals? So you make sub goals for each of those goals, and then you can strategize around, all right, how am I going to measure my progress in this direction? What are the things that might come up in the way? And then once you have all that information, then you can scale it down into this, who am I? And it really is like, who do I need to be in order to be the kind of person that's going to take those actions that's going to get me where I want to go? So it's like a data compression formula, right? And then you take that, that mantra of who you are and you can break that further by creating a sigil that represents it so that you have an image that you can then put externalized around you, whether it's on a piece of jewelry or your screen phone background, that every time you look at it, you remember who you are, what you need to be doing and where you're going with all that. Love it. I love it. Brilliant uh, recap of the perfect process to get you there. Available for free on my YouTube. Go check <laughs> it out. You can follow the whole program. It's got cool uh, lights, colors, sounds, all well, that. What's your YouTube? Peak transformation. Easy. Yeah. Well done. Say your mantra again. It's brilliant. 
I am a force for transformation. I awaken those around me through example. I push towards resistance and embody execution. Incredible. My concern would be I push towards resistance only because you're almost inviting it in. But I can see that from your, pers- I would presume your perspective is that it's there. Let's acknowledge it and let's it comes overcome. back. It comes back to Stephen Pressfield's book, The War of Art, being central to my operating system. Okay. Right. So this understanding that resistance is a force. It was originally I wore with resistance, Ooh, but no. I, but yeah, I was invited. <laughs> Don't do that. I was invited to change that, even Good. though I, I, I do, I do actually really like the war part because it invites my warrior forward, mm. which is an energy that I do want to embody. But I changed it to push towards resistance consciously because there are some associations with the war that I didn't want to invite in. But it, again, central to my operating system is this understanding of resistance, is this recognition that there are two forces working within me underneath all the different, you know, th- that angel and that demon. So it, it, it's, it's in the acknowledgement that, that that devil exists and that I'm pushing in the direction of opposition against it that helps to guide me. It's actually a navigating force, right? Because it's there whether you acknowledge it or not. And, and I think that's what's so powerful about this perspective is people who don't know that resistance is a thing think they are their resistance, so they identify with the resistance. It's not, it's not holy shit, I, I know I need to do the dishes, but I'm feeling a lot of resistance. It's, I don't want to do the dishes, which is a completely different thing, right? And it's one thing to lose the battle. It's one thing to, to, to know I should have done that. I didn't, I, 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 you know, I didn't have the willpower. I caved to the resistance. And it's another thing to think that you made that choice, you know, I th- I, so that that's the reason that that is central in that mantra. Um, Makes sense. It's like a salmon swimming upstream. You know, yeah. you can tell the salmon like, "Are you inviting the resistance?" It's like this is this is this is the reality. <laughs> There's water going this way, and I need to go this way. So that it, that's just my worldview. And some people it might not serve, but for me, it's been a very powerful mantra. Yeah, I can see that. Wonderful. You. Um, you mentioned there's an importance of prioritizing your body and mm-hmm. various levels of experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, what does that mean to you? Yeah. So again, I, I find value in viewing the body as foundational. For example, if I am, let's say I'm trying to solve a problem, right? I, and I just feel stuck on that problem. What I'm going to do first is move my body, get some sunshine, breathe, maybe get in some cold water, some hot, like do the things that switch my physiological state. And then I will then process the energetic emotions of it. Maybe I need to take a nap. Maybe I need to drink some coffee. I will get my energy and emotion primed. And then I will try to solve the problem as opposed to figuring it out up here while I'm sitting and my body's tense and my energy is low. So that prioritization is something I've found incredibly useful. Love it. Any final thoughts that you want to share? Just grateful to be here, grateful to share these ideas, grateful to have these talks. It's been so much internalized as I try to put together these pieces in a a, a way that's useful for people. So I'm grateful to have a platform to get to share these thoughts. And yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, It's a pleasure to have you on. And this is exactly what this platform's for. Thank you for sharing your genius. I love how you expressed everything. It was in ways I've never heard before. So... Really appreciate you. It's a pleasure and a privilege. <laughs> Thank you guys for tuning in. Not out yet, but when it does come out, uh, you'll be able to find me at bpeakxp.com. It's B E P E A K X P. Be your peak experience. Dot com. Uh, and on there I have like just, it's my home for all of the tools, right? I have a tab there just says free magic. And in there, I just try to put all of the practices and teaching from the peak integration protocol to guided breath work experiences to, you know, everything that I put my time into creating gets housed there. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram at embody underscore flow, E-M-B-O-D-Y underscore flow. Uh, my YouTube channel is Peak Transformation. Um, yeah, those are all the main hubs. I really, 
I've been loving YouTube lately, so go check that out because I got some really awesome content coming on there. Nice. All right, I'll put that all in the show notes so you guys can find that easily, and um, thank you again. 